became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel. Rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out. All for love, the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing, yeah. Jesus Messiah, name above all. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. <laughs> Great to have you this morning. Hey, do me a favor. Could you stand right where you're at? Find four or five people to welcome today and say hi. Ready? Go. One, two, three.
All right. Hey, just want to mention one thing as you're still standing. Go ahead and grab your bulletins right in there as our prayer card, folks. And again, we make it as simple as we can by providing you a writing utensil in the form of a pen. And so go ahead and write down a prayer request. That'd be great. We're going to send around our neat little basket that you can put those prayer requests into. I want to remind you, too, this is an essential part of who we are as a church, too. As you fill those out, we are going to uh, purposefully pray for that item. So go ahead and do that at this time as the band plays. And I'm just going to pray for us as we do that. Lord God, thank you so much that you are God. Father, the world could be difficult and chaotic and even falling apart, yet we have a God who's steady and steadfast. We praise you for that. So, Father, as we do that, we want to just be reminded of laying everything down right now at your feet. Open us up to what you have for us today. Lord, may it not escape us of what you're trying to teach us today. Your love, your compassion, your steadfastness. Thank you for being faithful to each one of us today. And we worship you for that this morning. Again, go before us by your Holy Spirit in your Son's name. Amen. We have a uh, special guest today, uh, and I'm just going to have uh, Jennifer Martin come up, and uh, she has been just fantastic. Jennifer, why don't you come on up? We uh, brought Jennifer Martin on to help us in our, mis on our missions team, and really, if there's anything happening missions-wise this past year, it's because of this fine lady. And so, hey, can we just give it up for Jennifer? I really appreciate her. Um, she gathers the prayer requests for all of our missionaries, whether they're abroad or locally. And she's also the one that um, interviews them uh, purposefully out over the phone or email or text. And then um, also is the one that picks our missionary of the month. Well, our missionary of the month today is, Jennifer, why don't you tell us who that is and who we're interviewing today? It's Joel Va Varner. Come on up. I'm really excited about what Joel has to say today. So he's going to speak first, and then I'm going to ask him a couple of follow-up questions. You want that? Yeah, that one? Okay. You like that? Yeah, that's okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, like Jennifer said, uh, my name is Joel Varner. To introduce you to some of those you don't know me, I see a lot, a lot of familiar faces, so it's so good to be here again. Um, but for those who don't know me or just are like, hey, Joel, what have you been up to recently? Um, we've actually uh, been a director for Forge Albany for the last several years. Um, before becoming a director with Forge Albany, and um, we were actually, I was actually a youth pastor for 15 years. Is that dying? Yeah. Oh, can you hear me now? Perfect. For 15 years, I was a youth pastor. Nine of those years was right here at NACC. Um, so it's so great to be back and see actually a lot of the youth who have just really grown up now. It's hard to recognize. Um, but one of the ways that we really, really facilitated the growth of our youth ministry, whether it was when a youth pastor in California or Washington or here at NACC or any church I've been a part of, the way we grew the church was really just bringing people to church. And it worked. It really did work. We, had, we saw some really cool success bringing people to church or the youth ministry, but it kind of worked for those who were willing to come to a church or youth ministry. But this, this thing kept bugging me in my mind. It was like, well, what about all the other youth or all the other adults who just won't go to a church? And what about them? I'm sure you know some of those. Like, Well, first of all, raise your hand if you know anyone in your workplace, your neighborhood, or your school who doesn't yet know Jesus. Raise your hand if you know anyone in your workplace, school, maybe your family, even your family members who just don't know Jesus. Okay. Now raise your hand if you've ever had a hard time bringing them to church or getting them to come to church. Right? Yeah. Like almost all of us. Right? So the question is, what do you do for those folks? Well, I was wrestling with this question, and finally a friend of mine asked, he said to me, he goes, well, what if we always stopped asking them to come to us, and we brought the church to them? What if we flipped that around? 
And that's what missionaries do in other countries, right? We see that in other, when a missionary goes to another country, he doesn't just load everyone up in an airplane and fly them back to the home church. He goes, no, what does it look like to be the church in this place I've been sent to? And they follow the example of Jesus who did this 2,000 years ago. Right? 2,000 years ago, Jesus wasn't sitting around in heaven waiting for us to come to him. He took the initiative and was sent to us. He came to us as one of us, and he connected with a wide variety of people, no matter who they were or what they did, and, and he served people's needs unconditionally, and he, and he started sharing this good news of the kingdom of God in and, and really understandable and ways that they could understand. And he brought a little bit of heaven to earth so that people could experience that. And so the question is, like, what if we could do what Jesus did 2,000 years ago? And what if we did what missionaries do in other countries, but we just do it in our own workplaces or our neighborhood or our schools or in our families? But then the question is, what does that look like? How do we actually do that? Would that even work today? And that's where Brenna and I really, really struggled. Like, we don't know if this will really work. But we knew we had to try so the first thing we started doing was like starting to get our neighbors to come together. So we started throwing some block parties. We did this one thing called National Night Out. Actually, a few weeks ago, I think it was National Night Out. We did this National Night Out barbecue to get to know our neighbors because we didn't actually know any of them, and none of them knew each other. We knew one woman who said she'd been on our street for 20 years and had never once met any of her neighbors. It's like, we need to get our neighbors together. So we got together, and we ate, and they laughed and, pl and played and got to know each other. And so every month we were just like, okay, how can we get our neighbors together with any sort of gathering, whether that's like a 4th of July party or a Christmas party or Cinco de Mayo, St. Paddy's Day, whatever we can do to get people together to get to know each other. And then we wanted to serve each other's needs. So then it was, okay, after every little gathering, we'd, we'd ask, who needs help with anything in the neighborhood? And then we as neighbors would help them. And sometimes it'd be like raking leaves or or painting a fence, or maybe fixing a car, or buying food for someone, or visiting someone in the hospital. But every time we got together, we said, who needs help, and then how can we help them together? And then our neighbors started asking some questions. They started going, OK, what is happening in our neighborhood? What, what, we're all a bunch of strangers living on one street now. Are people coming together, knowing each other by name, and like helping each other out like on a, on a weekly basis? Like, What is happening? And they kept kind of pestering me like Joel who are you see for the first several years I actually didn't even let them know that I worked in a church or even that I was a Christian I really really tried to like not let them know but they kept pestering me like finally like one woman came up to me and she goes Joel who are you what is going on here and I kind of kept putting her off putting her off she goes no I need I need to know what's going on and I finally said to her I was like well I need you to know I'm a Christian, and I just wanted to share God's love with you and the rest of this neighborhood. And she looked at me, and she goes, oh, I knew it. Oh, I knew it was some sort of God-Jesus thing. But instead of like normally it was before when I told people I was a Christian, they kind of leaned back and ran away. She leaned forward and started engaging and asking questions about God and faith. And then when it came out that all the other neighbors found out I was a Christian, they started asking more questions. And so we started saying, hey, what if we all got together every other week and had a dinner and opened up some scripture and, and talked about life and God and prayed for one another? And so that's what we started doing. And neighbors started getting together, and, and we had dinners together and, and started discussing about life and God. And that's what we've been doing. We just repeat that. Every month we find a reason to get together and connect, and every month we try to serve one another. And every two weeks, we get together and, and read some scripture, eat some dinner, and pray for one another. And God's been faithful to help us do that for the last 10 years in our neighborhood. And so after a while, people started hearing about what was happening in our community. And they're like, what would that look like in our own neighborhood, or my own workplace? And so we started wanting to train other people, like, what it, would it look like for them to be missionaries on their own street? And we've noticed that a lot of people do want to engage their neighbors. You do really want to engage your neighbors. You're like, but how? What do I start? And, and is there a plan? So we felt called to create this official ministry called Forge Albany. And it trains anyone who wants to be a missionary where you're already doing life, where our, God's already sent you. And we've gotten to go to a lot of different churches to do lots of different trainings, like one-day trainings and weekly trainings and monthly trainings and one weekend intensives. And as a missionary supported by NACC, we're actually going to do some of those trainings here in October. 
So during the month of October, we're going to do a month-long training on what it looks like to be a community missionary. So if anyone's interested in that, we're going to have more information on how you can get involved on September 12th at the NACC Ministry Fair. So we'll have a little booth with all the other ministries that are happening that you can get involved with the NACC. And if you're saying, hey, how can I get more involved in my community? We'll have an opportunity for you to say to learn about how you can engage more with your neighbors. If you're also wanting to more, know more about Fort Jolbany or just the people involved with that as well, you can go to fortjolbany.org and also be hanging around after here just talking to you guys if you have any questions or just want to know and catch up. Um, but I think Jennifer also has some follow-up questions as well for me. So, Jennifer, hit me with it. He already answered one of my questions, so I'll move on to the other two. How's that sound? <laughs> um, um, have you found that there is a lot of people seeking Christ? They just don't know how to get involved. Yes. Well, I think there are a lot of people seeking answers. They don't know that they're found in Christ. And so uh, a lot of people that I know may not know the name of Jesus or they've heard the name of Jesus, but they don't like how maybe he's been presented to them. So they're not seeking him, but they're seeking answers to life. What's my purpose in life? What's wrong with this world? What's, what's the solution? How am I supposed to live? So we've tried to engage those people with those and basically saying, this is your purpose in life. And ultimately, they're revealed in Jesus. So it's not presenting them necessarily Jesus first, but he's the answer to the questions that they're seeking all along. How can NACC help your mission? Well, one of the, I mean, personally, just be praying for us. I was just telling someone that, like, our biggest support need is we have is just prayer. I mean, God, God opens doors through prayer. And so just pray for opening doors just in our own neighborhood, but also with all the churches that we're working with as well. Um, so we're working with about a half a dozen churches in the area. And they're seeking how do we mobilize our people to be engaged in their communities as well. So be praying for that. Um, and then just, uh, yeah, just your prayer support and just kind of saying, all right, looking for each one of us to be saying like, all right, how am I going to be engaged where I already am? And so I think not just supporting this mission, but how are we going to support your guys' mission as well too. So. And finally, how can we pray for you and your family and, and for Albany? Yeah, so all the workers, the people who are involved with Forge Albany, they're all bivocational. It means they all work regular jobs and then do support raising as well. So just pray for just that continued support, and thank you for NACC supporting us as well, making the ministry possible. Um, so just be praying just for continued uh, participation and support with that. And, um, yeah, I think just, just continue to, like, I would continue to open up those doors. Thank you very much, Joel, and... I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. All right. We're going to have some worship, so why don't y'all stand? Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be Father, the 
your friend Your kindness makes us whole And you shoulder our weakness And your strength becomes our own You're making me like you Clothing me in a white Bringing beauty from ashes For you will have your bride Free of all her guilt Rid of all her shame Known by her true name And it's why I sing your praise Will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your, Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt To 
that stones moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born Excellent. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you, team. Good job this morning. As always, just kind of lifting the Lord's name. Uh, we are continuing in our series on the Ten Commandments, and we are on number nine as we're looking at those. And uh, I'll start off with a brief survey this morning. How many of you have lied? Raise your hand. Oh, a couple of hesitant ones there. You, you know, if you didn't raise your hand, you, you already lied, because Psalm 116... Psalm 116 says, all mankind are liars. So if we trust God's word, then we know uh, you're a liar. So good to know, good to know. Uh, we're looking at, at this passage in Exodus chapter 20. And so if you've got your Bible or your, your device or what you would like to, uh, to find, go there, stick your finger there or flag it in your phone. And, and uh, we're going to look at this idea of lying. And as I read through the commandments, I was reminded once again that this particular commandment does not deal so much with um, lying, although that's implied, it really talks about bearing false witness. Don't say something against somebody that is untrue. But the implication there is that, that we shouldn't lie. Can your, can your words be trusted? There was a University of Massachusetts study that was done that said 60% of people lie at least once during a 10-minute conversation. Imagine that. Lie at least once. 60% of people. Women were, more, women were more likely to lie to make the other person in the conversation that they were talking to feel good. You know where I'm going with this, right? And, and men, on the other hand, would lie often to make themselves look good. Ah, oh, very interesting. Yeah. There was a, a guy who was driving down a country road, and he saw a sign that said, Talking dog. For sale, five dollars. And he's like, that, "This is too good to pass up. I got to see this." So he stops and he goes and he visits with the with the farmer. He says, "You got a talking dog? Yeah, you're gonna sell him? Yeah, five bucks? Yeah." He goes, "Can I see this dog?" He goes, "Yeah, he's out back. Go ahead." The guy goes out back. He says, "Can you talk?" And the dog says, "Sure, I can talk." He says, "Well, tell me your story." He says, well, for a long time, you know, I was discovered that I could talk and understand people. And so I was hired by the CIA and they would put me in rooms with world leaders. and I would get information. I would come back and tell. After a while, that started to wear on me. And so I went to work at the airports or TSA and I could overhear conversations, you know, making sure people were honest in the airport and carrying their own luggage and that sort of thing. So then I got old too. And so I just sort of retired from that. Well, the guy was, he was gobsmacked. He couldn't believe this dog could talk and hold conversations. He went back to the farmer. He said, why are you only selling this dog? This is a, a miracle. How come you're selling this dog for five bucks? And the farmer said, oh, he's a liar. He didn't do any of those things he said he could do. <laughs> Point missed. But, but, it, does, but it, does, uh, it does explain to us why um, words are so, so important and, and how our word with others can be uh, significant in in our relationships and, and what it means. I don't know if you've ever been uh, betrayed maybe by a lie, but it happens. 
As we're looking at um, this particular passage, we want to read through it every week. We've read through the the Ten Commandments. So what I'm going to have you do, right where you're at, go ahead and stand up. You can read along with me on your device or your Bible. I'll read. If you don't have anything with you, that's okay. You can just listen to God's Word as He speaks to us in Exodus chapter 20. And we'll start with the first verse. We go right through about the 17th verse. This is what it says. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall do no work. You, your sons, your daughters, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner or visitor who is within your gates. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the the Lord God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Uh, Lord, thank you for this list, which is really just a sample of the commands you give us in Scripture. But they are so important and they need to be taken to heart by us, especially this one today as we think about the idea of our words and how important they are how important it is to be truthful in all that we say and do. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, go ahead and have a seat. As I was, as I was working on the, the Ten Commandments over the last few months, uh, one of the things that came up, and, and this has been brought up to me by a few of you, is if you come from a different background, maybe a Lutheran background or, or a Catholic background, you know the Ten Commandments differently. And that's because, and here's your Hebrew lesson for the day, right? When they, when they wrote Hebrew, they didn't have commas and periods and things like that. And so it was really up to the interpreters to understand where one sentence would end and another sentence would begin. It's not that the scripture was any different. They just aligned things up different. They all came out with 10, but sometimes they were structured a little bit differently. And so we, as believers in Christ Jesus, holding to the scriptures that we have, we believe in, in the... Uh, polemic view of how they were structured. It's the earliest. It's the one that's closest to those who knew it best and wrote it best and and had it in the oral tradition. And so that's the order that we follow them in. I'm going to have, let's see, I don't know, whoever wants to do this, I suppose. I'm going to hand these out. These are just bookmarkers. And so you can take one, pass it down your row, and pass it to the row behind you. As you get uh, one of these, it's just all it is is a reminder of what the Ten Commandments are. And you can take one of those. Wow, no feedback when I walked out there. That's good. That means I can be right in your face. Um, and we're just going to continue in, in, in our series. Jen Wilkins writes this in her, in her book on the Ten Commandments. says, the third word, and that's what the commandments were referred to in the Old Testament, the words of God. In the third word, it bade us to honor God's good name. But in the ninth commandment, it bids us to honor the good name of our neighbor. So as we think about uh, our neighbor and, and what it means to be a good neighbor, Joel just was here explaining how to share the gospel you know, with the neighbors, literal neighbors around you. But those that you work with, those that are in your family, those that are around you, it's very important that they know they can trust your word. Um, here's what I'm hoping that we learn today. Because God is truth, we must tell the truth. Simply put, God wants us to be truthful because he is truthful. If we're going to reflect God in our lives, then we have to be as truthful with others around us as he is. God says it and does is true. Everything God says and does is true. And, and he himself is truth. Isaiah chapter 65 says he is called the God of truth. Hebrews 6 18 says, it is impossible for God to lie. In Psalm 51, David tells us that God delights 
in behold. You delight in truth in, 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 in the inward being. In other words, truth throughout our life, not just even in our words, but in our soul. The things we think need to be true. Um, there are six things that the Lord hates, even seven, it tells us in Proverbs 6. He hates a haughty eye, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among others. So how do we lay out the idea of lying? I mean, it's easy just to come and say, hey, read this, do not lie. That's a simple, straightforward statement. But what does it look like practically for us when we are people who are living a lie? Or we are people who want to avoid living a lie? What are the things that we should avoid? These are, these are them. First of all, we see in this passage the idea of false accusations. False accusations. When we see people testifying in court one against another, we want to make sure that they're telling the truth, right? That's how we get to the bottom of a court case is to hear the truth presented, and then we know what to look for. Um, oftentimes, you know, we, it's been said, well, my truth isn't your truth, and that's, that's true. I mean, perspective takes place in, in our life, in each person's life, and I may have a different perspective than somebody else when it comes to what really is true but there's also then above that the objective truth if you came down from another planet and you observed the the ongoing things the goings on of our planet you you'd be able to say what exactly happened and what is true and what isn't true uh, when i was a kid the, the lie that comes back to me quite often uh, is when i was about i want to say maybe eh, eight nine years old I had gotten some new shoes. I didn't grow up in a very wealthy family, but I got some new shoes. We'd do that about once a year before school would start. And in my neighborhood, we lived in Southern California. There were canyons all around, and we would play in the canyons as kids. And I remember the day I got my new shoes, we were going down, and they weren't expensive shoes. I mean, they weren't, you know, they weren't Hoka's or Nike's or whatever you're, you, know, you pay 150 bucks for now. What they were was pretty much the, the local shoe store. Shoes weren't a big deal. You'd get the PF flyers, or you'd get the... The Converse high tops, maybe if you're lucky. Usually, I got like the Kmart brand, and uh, but that but that was okay. They were new and they would last me. They would just make them work, right? And I got these shoes, and the very day we went and got them, that afternoon was my friends playing in the canyon. We we're coming up out of the canyon, not to make a story too long, but the shoes got muddy coming out of the canyon, brand new, right? I just knew I was going to get killed, so I took them off so they wouldn't get muddy anymore, and I start climbing in my bare feet, which is this is cool. And in order to grab onto the, the walls of the canyon, pretty steep, it wasn't a, like rock climbing, but it was fairly steep, I would take my shoes and I would throw them up about 20 or 30 feet ahead of me and then I would climb up and I'd grab them and I'd throw them out. Well, I threw them and then lost them. So when I got home, I had no shoes. My dad, who was, you know, a fairly decent disciplinarian, said, where are your shoes? Well, there was this guy and he... And he stopped us all as we were in the canyon, and he took my shoes, and he wouldn't give them back. And he got, I mean, I had, it was a whopper. It was so big, even my dad thought it was real. I mean, it just couldn't be a lie. Nobody would make, fabricate something that large. And he went to my friend's house, you know, to ask him what happened. And he went, he and my brother and I went down to the canyon to see if we could catch these guys, you know. But my dad found out soon enough, I had lied. And I paid the price for that, right? In my family, that meant a trip to the bathroom and dad would close the door and usually it was his hand, sometimes it was a belt and that was how things were handled. Well, I just remember that, the memory of that comes back to me and always comes back to me over the course of my life. And as a result, I think, hmm, lying is probably not a healthy thing to do. Especially, <laughs> I shouldn't say especially if you get caught, but especially if you get caught. I mean, it's just not good for you. And so in various ways, we learn that telling the truth is a good thing. Uh, that good thing is reinforced here in God's word. But even if you're making false accusations, um, you, you don't want to do it whether it's an invisible person who you say stole your shoes or whether it's a, it's a buddy at work or somebody else in your life. When you say something false about them, that's directly what God's talking about here. In the day, back in the day when they dealt with these things in court, they didn't have DNA. Uh, when the Ten Commandments were given and Moses is leading everybody through the promised land and they're rebelling and he's trying to bring them back to God, you know that cycle. And 
they didn't have DNA, they didn't have fingerprints, they didn't have photographs of wanted, you know, most wanted men and rewards and things like that, but what they did have was they had courts, just like we have. And one of the things they required was that if a witness was to testify, it wasn't going to be just to get his buddy off the hook, right? And so they're saying, don't make false accusations, and, and the way that applied to them was simply this, it, it was the idea that if they were to make a false accusation, they could swing a court case, because it all hinged on people telling the truth. Um, in that cultural context, it was difficult for them to lie because they were told three things as a witness in a court, was that if you lied, number one, you, you, you would get the same penalty as the person who you were lying for. So keep that in mind. Somebody asked you to tell an untruth on their behalf. Imagine if you had to take down the same uh, same uh, ending or the same you know, result that they would have. If he was a murderer and he was going to be stoned, well, you were going to be stoned right along with him for bearing a false, a false witness. The second thing was, um, not only would you receive the same thing as the accused, but you had to throw uh, the first stone to kill the accused before you got in the ring and they killed you. And that sounded interesting. You had to throw the first stone. And for, lastly, it was, it was interesting is that there had to be, in a court case back then, there had to be more than just one witness. They never relied on just one witness. So you not only had to make a deal with the guy who was accused, but you got to hope that he made a deal with somebody else who was going to hold up the deal, or you were going to be caught. So they had their own way of dealing with lying, right? Today we're a li- bit more sophisticated, but that's kind of how they handled it in their day. Albert Moeller said this, he said, in an, in an honor culture where reputation meant everything and life and death could hang in the balance, false witnesses could kill. Truth must always be spoken about one's neighbor, for even one incident of false accusation could unravel the social fabric of an entire small community. Um, imagine you're in a small group, and we, we use that word community in a lot of ways now, but imagine you're in a small group and you get together every week and you study God's word and you pray together and you're, you're together. And then somebody in that group makes a false accusation about somebody else in that group. Imagine how that group could become, instead of a, a cohesive, growing, exciting, vibrant, small community, they become a mess. And somebody usually has to step in and figure out the mess, right? And usually the people that are involved there, they find their way elsewhere. Sort of like when you lift the the equipment in the barn and all the rats go scurrying. Everybody looks for another place to go. Even the innocent are looking for another place to go. So false accusations here are are critical and and, uh, God's word tells us we we don't want to create those false accusations because they have repercussions. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Exodus 23, one through three says, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with many who do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in a lawsuit. Proverbs 24 says, it it sort of warns us, it says, be not a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive with your lips. Um, We'll get into it here in a little bit, but we see a lot of this in our culture today because we want to believe that those we're working with are telling us the truth, and so we buy in, and we become along with them those with false accusations. So we want to take on that first thing that it tells us in, in Exodus, and that is don't bear false witness against your neighbor. The second thing is just simply lying. The first sin committed on earth by Satan was to tell a lie to Eve. You shall surely not die is what he told Eve. And we've been living with that consequence ever since. In John chapter 8, um, this is what Jesus says about Satan. He says, he says, Satan, he's a liar and the father of lies. And when we lie, we're dining with the devil and demonstrating that we hate God and people, uh, that we hate God. And then Proverbs 26 says, a lying tongue hates those that it hurts. So just even the idea of lying has an impact, we're told by Scripture here, we can sort of surmise that all of our lies have an impact on people around us. Big lies and little lies will have that kind of impact. 
Thirdly, we see the idea of gossip. How, well, what does gossip have to do with it, Tom? Well, gossip is nothing more really than a, a social lie, right? Someone said that gossip is just a fool with a keen sense of humor. In Proverbs 26.20, it says, For lack of wood, a fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, quarreling and gossip cease. I, I love, that's a great verse. When I came across that this week, I, I, I really struck me. So remember this, this rule about gossip. The more interesting it is, the more likely it is to be false. The more interesting it is, the more likely it is to be false. Think about our culture. Think about things that are being said. It doesn't matter what side or what political beliefs you have or what you're thinking about one thing or another. Just think about our culture in general. And apply that rule. The more interesting it is, the more likely it is to be false. That's a pretty broad brush that we're painting with there. Basically what we're saying is look closely at the things that you're being told. I think one of the, as I I read in a book a couple of weeks ago, was talking about this very phenomenon and and why people believe what they believe. It's talking about in society, not necessarily as Christians. And One of the things that it pointed out was that we see somebody that we want them to be right. We want that person to be right. And we want them to be right so badly that we will believe anything they feed us, right? And so that person says something, and we want to believe, for whatever reason, that they are right. I want them to be the hero. I want them to be, right, the the savior. Or I want them to be the one that can be looked up to. And so consequently, we ascribe truth to the things they say to us, even though what they say may not be true. And, we'll, and, and I've seen this in my life. In fact, I've lost friendships over it, where people will believe something so heartily that it doesn't matter what anybody else says or thinks or does around them, they'll even end friendships because they want to believe so badly. Um, the question was asked uh, when Joel was down here, I, I think, I think the, the question, what, what I heard was, uh, you know, do people, do people want to know Jesus? Or do they know, the answer, do they know that Jesus is the answer? Or something along those lines. And, and I think we live in a culture where people, in their freedom of thought, which is not everywhere in the world, but in our country, the freedom of thought, they really do want to find an answer. They really are seeking it out. It's just that as believers, we, we sit back and we don't do anything when it comes to truth. And so consequently, at least uh, the, the greater truths, and so consequently, people find answers in strange places because they want to believe. Their heart is built to believe, and they find something to believe in. Christians, we have to give the gospel in word and in deed so that people know truth, God's truth. And so that when they latch their lives onto something, it will be truth. It won't be gossip. It won't be uh, hearsay. So lying and gossip fits right in with that. Uh, I, years ago, we had a picnic with our church, and I remember we were on one side of the church. We were at a park, and one side of the park, we had, uh, the kids were playing, and we had water balloons, and we had water balloon launchers. And we would, you know, pull those things back. It was that medical tubing stuff that stretches. And we'd pull and we'd launch balloons. And then that guy, those, those guys, they'd launch balloons back. And we'd all get wet. And it was really fun. And on the other side of the park, not too far, maybe to our parking lot there, we had a group of adults that were playing. And they were playing volleyball. And they were out there, you know, some of them were just out there to have fun. And, and others are thinking they're going to go to the Olympics. You know, they just think they're big cheese. And they're doing their, they're doing their adult thing. They don't want to play with the kids. And so we had about half of our balloons left. And we did this. Boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden, in the middle of this really serious volleyball game, splash, 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 splash. And then we all ran. And, and, and you know, so that, that's that. But the point of that is, is this simply. Uh, those balloons, they were small, right? Just a little bit of water, a cup of water, maybe two cups of water in each balloon. But man, they could disrupt the game, right? Enough of those little suckers and the adults were scattering that didn't want to get wet. The game was done, right? We did the damage. And lies and gossip can be that same, very same thing. It can implode, and it might be just really small, but as it it hits its target, it can create lots and lots of damage. So we have to be sure that in the area of gossip, 
we are immune, that we are uh, those who abhor gossip, who put it aside, who won't be a part of it. Proverbs 16, 28, a gossip separates close friends. It's happened. It's happened in my life. So one problem with gossip is that the information is often false. And, and Cordell uh, Hull, a long time ago, said this, and you've probably heard it before. A lie can get up and go halfway around the world before the truth gets its pants on. And that's really true for, for us in the area of gossip. We can say one thing that will just destroy, like those small water balloons, even though it's not a big word, it can destroy people and, and lives around us. Proverbs 18.8 says, The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. You know, it's really true when when we talk about a whisper or or a gossip, um, it's so hard to turn away, isn't it? All you have to do is think about the last time somebody said to you, hey, did you hear about? And you were all ears. I feel like sometimes on Sunday morning when I'm going to preach, I should get and just go, hey, did you hear about? And I I know I'd immediately have everybody's attention because we just love that. We want to hear something new, something fresh, maybe something that convicts somebody. We do it for lots of reasons. We do it because it makes us feel good, right? Oh, yeah, that guy. Oh, that woman. Yeah, oh, yeah, I feel I'm much better than they are because look what you're saying about them. Or sometimes it's like cash or cachet. We, We like to hear a tidbit like that and stick it in our pocket. And what do we do with it? We go down the block, and we have a conversation, let me tell you. We pull it out of the pocket, and we share it. Like we knew it firsthand, even though it was shared with us. And so gossip spreads, and we're a part of that that spider web of gossip. And and to be honest, the Bible is always so truthful with us. us. It it does feel good. The words of a whisperer, the words of a slanderer, the words of a gossip, ooh, those words go down so easy. We are so inclined to listen to that stuff. So gossip. The next one closely related to it is slander. Slander, the fourth thing. Slander is making a false statement designed strictly to harm somebody. God has no tolerance for it. In Leviticus, he speaks out against it. In Psalm 101 and 1 Peter 2.1. In Romans chapter uh, uh, chapter 1, 29 to 30. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, Paul says. Um, it's interesting that in Romans, the idea of slandering somebody is the mark of a deprived life. Like that, that God would instruct Paul to put that in amongst some of the most vile sins that we could think of. And he adds slander to that list. So we have to take it seriously when God says don't slander. Ancient rabbis taught about slander uh, that it kills three people. It kills the one who speaks it. It kills the one who listens to it. And it kills the one about whom it's spoken. Isn't that true? So the impact of your words is so incredibly uh, forceful. This particular sin, slander, spreads like gangrene. Um, Probably one of the best examples you can think of is, is social media. There's so much on social media that is just slander. One person, and and again, we get back to that first element of what do I believe? Who do I believe? Okay, I'll choose to believe this person. Hopefully, they're not slandering anybody, right? But if they are, and you buy into that, it's out there in in more ways than we can even count when you get into social media. It's everywhere. The fifth one is like slander, only it's sort of the opposite. The fifth one is flattery. Think about flattery and how we flatter people. Flattery can be defined as the act of giving excessive compliments generally for the, for the, person, for the purpose excuse me, of ingratiating oneself uh, with the subject. Uh, the d- quickest example I can think of that is last night I was watching the women's gold medal match uh, ba- in basketball. The U.S. team of women were playing against the Japanese team of women. Now think about the Japanese. They're in Tokyo. It's their, they're on their home turf. And they're playing for the gold medal in basketball. I didn't know, first of all, that they had a women's basketball team. And then secondly, that they were any good at all. And the first thing I thought of, because I'm, you know, I just think this way. I, I thought they must have rigged the, the, the tournament, right? So that their leg of the tournament was easy so they could get there. That was the f- that was first thing I thought. Then I watched them play. And you know what? They're, they're pretty good. There was a distinct disadvantage. Their team was significantly smaller than the American team. The American team had four or five uh, players on their team that were just 
just tall. I mean, they didn't even have to jump to get the rebounds. I mean, they were just really tall and really big. And um, they were ahead. No doubt you probably caught on to this, but the, the U.S. women's team was ahead. Uh, I don't know what they won by. I ended up changing the game. But when I was watching, they were ahead by about 25 points. And it was getting close to the end of the game. And they were way up on the, on the Japanese team. And what do announcers have to say when the game is that far gone? They're, you know, they're, nobody's really intently watching anymore. You're getting up from your couch. You're going to the refrigerator, right? I mean, this, this baby's over. And yet, what did they have to talk about? <laughs> Not a lot. So, so immediately, they begin going down the roster of the American women. Well, she will be the oldest Olympian to receive a gold medal. And she's been on five uh, Olympic basketball teams. And uh, then they go to the next one. And she's in great career in the WNBA. And they're, and they're just flattering and flattering. Well, why do they do that? Very simple. They do that because that's going to keep you in your seat. Right? That's going to keep their ratings up. That's going to keep you interested in what's on television. They don't want you wandering off to your refrigerator. So they use flattery. But flattery can sometimes get you into trouble. Ken Hughes, an author and a pastor, said this, Gossip involves saying behind a person's back what you would never say to their face. Flattery means saying to a person's face what you would probably never say behind their back. The idea that they would just pour it on and pour it on and talk about how great these women basketball players were. That's flattery. Now, maybe nobody's ever flattered you that way. Proverbs 29 says, A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. A flatterer is one who pats you on the back today only to locate a soft spot to insert the knife tomorrow. Great quote uh, by Ken Hughes. The sixth thing is deception. Straight out deception. Sir Walter Scott, who said, oh, what a tangled web we weave when, when we practice to deceive, right? That idea that one lie begets another lie, and pretty soon there's a whole story of deception. That's what happened to me in my shoes as a kid. You know, it went from, well, I was in the canyon to there were these make-believe guys, and I didn't say they were make-believe, but there were these make-believe guys, and they kind of held us up in the canyon, and they stole my shoes. And uh, what my dad, I remember my dad distinctly in the middle of that lie saying, well, what were they wearing? I mean, he was going to go look, these, look for these guys. Well, I'm saying, he's got pants kind of like yours, and he's got a shirt kind of like, and I point to my brother, and, you know, and I'm just making it up as I go along. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh gosh, I've got to remember all this stuff. Well, eight-year-old lie, it fell apart pretty quickly. But what we find is this idea of deception, Proverbs 24 says, do not deceive with your lips. And Romans 3 goes on to say, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Paul talking about those who are deceivers. Well, you can imagine how that plays out in our life. The people that are in our lives who deceive us. For some of us, it's family members. The people we think we can trust the most closely. And for some of us, it's good friends. For some of us, we know who the deceivers are and we steer clear. The FBI received a record number of complaints about cybercrime this last year. Spoofers, spammers, scanners spreading fraud across the internet, including scams related to COVID-19, costing Americans a staggering $4.2 in losses. It was an increase in deception, internet deception of 69%, they figure, over 2019 the very year before. Imagine, we lost, just by people deceiving other people, 4.2 billion. Imagine what we could have done with 4.2 billion dollars to relieve some of the social ills that we have in our country. That's amazing to me that there's that much money to be made in deception on the internet. Another way we lie is it's a, a lie of, of uh, silence. And that's the seventh type of lying, silence. Are you being silent about things that you should be raising your voice about? Ecclesiastes 3 says, uh, there's a time to keep silent and there's a time to speak. Consider uh, James chapter 4. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. How many times have you been called on by God to speak up and you did not speak up? It might be something as clear as sharing the gospel at work. It might be something as, as complex as stepping into a social uh, situation in our community where your voice needs to be heard, whether it be about uh, uh, abortion or whether it, it be about some other critical concern for believers, and you've held back. You've said, well, 
I do my Christian thing on Sunday, but I'm really not going to get involved in other ways. Maybe it has to do with, with feeding the homeless. Something as simple as doing a good deed and, and you step back and you remain silent in that situation. Maybe it's just something as close to you as the way policies are made in your workplace or on a school board or in your community. And you're, you're saying to yourself, I, I, I think that's just a weird thing. I've got my own ideas and I'm pretty sure I'm in tune with the Lord on this, but I'm just going to step back. Let somebody else step into the fray. Let somebody else go ahead and take part. And that would be a lie of omission we would call it that would be a lie of silence whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it james says it's sin two passages in proverbs have greatly informed uh, my my own belief and the way i teach in areas of uh, injustice and primarily in the in the area of uh, of the abortion issue proverbs 24 says rescue those who are taken away to death hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we do not know this, uh, we, we did not know this does not, excuse me, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? And Proverbs chapter 31 goes on to say, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. You know, when God gives us a, a command like that in another part of Scripture, in Proverbs, when He gives us a command like that, it's, it's our obligation to fulfill that command, to, to do those things, regardless of where you are in life. You say, oh, but Tom, I can't speak to those issues because I don't know enough. Or maybe the opposite. You say, oh, Tom, I can't, I can't really speak to those issues because I've been involved. No, we have to speak up for people who are struggling. That's that's our job as believers. We're supposed to do that. And when we step back from doing those things, we're lying. We're lying about the power of the gospel. We're lying about our relationship with God. We're just lying. We're stepping back and we're saying, I believe something on Sunday, but I believe something else the rest of the week. And so we have to be careful that by our lie of omission, we aren't, we aren't truly finding guiltlessness. We aren't truly finding innocence. All we're doing is lying about what we believe God wants us to do. Eighth is false teaching. And of course, this is where it gets into preaching and interpretation and those sorts of things. And we listen to the words in 1 Timothy that say, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, though the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. In Jude, probably a book that maybe you haven't read in a long time, it says this, so we're to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We're to be good at sharing the gospel, but we're also to be good at understanding it. And so we don't want to teach it if we don't know it. We want to we wanna have a good a good uh, arsenal of Scripture and, and systematic theology, the understanding of Scripture in our, in, our, in our head. And you say, but Tom, I don't have those things. How can I make a difference if I don't have those things? I'm saying, get those things. It's not rocket science. It's easy to be a part of a Bible study. It's easy to be a part of discipleship. This year, you know, our, our three-pronged fork in this church is be in worship, be in a small group, be in discipleship, right? Because out of that will come this idea of teaching truth. We want you to be able to understand it so when you hear something, you can put it through your grid and understand whether it's true or not. We want you to uh, understand it well enough to be able to share it with those around you. So be in worship, be in a small group, be in discipleship, and you'll hear that more and more, especially as we get to the fall, we move back inside. You'll hear about small groups starting up again this year after summer's over and we get back together and meet somebody's home and we share uh, together in prayer, but also in study. And we want you to be a part of that. So be a part of worship, but be a part of small group. Be a part of discipleship. So false teaching is in what Christians have always had to defend against deadly doctrine. The, the pace of that is picking up in our world. Be careful that you're listening to good doctrine. That's number eight. Now, what's our response? Well, first of all, tell the truth. Tell the truth. That's simple enough. Tell the truth. 
Um, I just want to share this acronym with you, but post, post verse here, Ephesians 4, gives us this strong challenge. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, okay, so we're going to set aside all that lying that, that uh, Exodus talks about. Set aside and putting away all falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Talking there to the church in Ephesians, right? If we're going to be a family of believers, then we've got to understand what it means to share the truth with each other. So that's number one. And this is an acronym that I find really good. It's the word THINK. So write this down in your notes if you've got it, the word THINK, and this is what it stands for. T, is it true? Is what you're talking about truthful? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? Is it kind? Um, you may not have to write that down. It's not necessarily scripture, but try to remember that the next time you're passing something along and you want to know if it's truth or not, uh, examine it carefully before you pass it along. Secondly, teach the truth. So tell the truth, teach the truth. We must make sure that we teach everything we know that is truthful. Um, according to Deuteronomy uh, 6, verse 6 and 7, parents are charged to teach God's truth to their children, to the next generation. It says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk with them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So we need to constantly combat lies by teaching the truth. Follow your heart, says the world. Follow me, says Jesus. Believe in yourself, says the world. Believe in me, says Jesus. Now discover yourself, says the world. Deny yourself, says Jesus. Be true to you, says the world. Be true to me, says Jesus. So we want to teach opposite or counter to much of what the world is teaching. And then third is the idea of testifying to the truth. The final command Jesus gave us is for us to be witnesses who testify to his life, his death, his, his burial, his resurrection. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. He's talking to his disciples. It applies to us as disciples as well. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. Are you his witness? Tell the truth. And then teach the truth. And then testify of Christ's truth. And lastly, trust the truth. John 14, 6, amid all of the error and everything else that's going on in our world, trust the truth that you know of God. What is it that you know? Maybe you don't know much. Maybe you'd say, oh, I don't really know that much. I know what my parents taught me as a kid. I, I know a little bit from the Bible studies I've been in, but live what you know and try to know more. Trust the truth. John 18, 38 says this, what is truth? He asked the right question, but he didn't kind of stick around for the answer. And, and when we see um, uh, in that passage what truth is, and he the, the asker didn't even stick around. Um, that was Pilate's you know, question to Jesus. What is the truth? And he just walked off from Jesus. Um, there's a, a song, the lyrics to a song called The Voice of Truth. It's by a group called Casting Crowns. They, they say this, Out of all the voices calling to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. Hey, if you've got your outline, go ahead and stand up with it. Hold it in front of you. If maybe somebody next to you doesn't have it, at the bottom of that outline is a paragraph that I'm going to read to you, and, and I just want you to sort of read it with me. You don't have to read it out loud, but you can read it with me. Go ahead and stand up. It'll give your legs a good stretch. And this is what it says uh, in that last paragraph on your outline. God's people are a people of truth. We are to honor and tell the truth, to defend the truth, and to discern the truth, to love the Bible as the word of God that is truth, without any mixture of, of error, and to stand for truth. We are to uphold the truth even, in the whole, even if the whole world disbelieves, hates, and subverts the truth. We are the people of the truth for one single and irreducible reason. Our God is true. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks so much for today. Just to, to take the time to... Uh, do what we often don't do, just to take the time to take a morsel of your word and just sort of ruminate on it, to look at it, to see what it has to tell us. And it's so much deeper than just don't lie, although that is the simplified version. 
So God, we would just ask now that you would make us a people who are committed to the truth, who love you and know you as the truth, and who are unwilling to follow anything but the truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stay standing for our last worship tune.